it gives me distinct pleasure to introduce um, our speakers this morning. There are actually going to be two. And this presentation is a representation of a brand new collaboration that has started here in the Mailman Center, a product of our new interprofessional collaboration efforts here and the Community Health and Wellness, IPC in particular. So um, we are really happy to have um, Ms. Erica Grover here this morning. She is the director of the Miami-Dade County WIC program, which is the Women, Infants, and Children Supplemental Nutrition Program, um, which serves our lower income women and young children in our community. And an interesting fact that I learned as we've been working together is that half of all women in our county qualified for WIC. And to show you the breadth and depth of the work that she is responsible for every day, they have 73,000 clinical encounters a month in Miami-Dade County through 16 clinics. So it's a massive volume of work. So, Ms. Grover has an MPH and an MS from the University of Tennessee, and she's also a licensed dietitian and registered dietitian in the state of Florida, um, and she has a bachelor's from the University of Florida. So, um, she is responsible for overseeing this entire program for the county, and we're really excited to have her here. She's going to give um, an overview of the program, and then we're going to follow up with um, a student of mine who's a second year PhD student in the prevention program, Ms. Cynthia LeBron, um, who we have um, submitted now um, two applications to the state IRB to pull six years worth of data from the county, which Cynthia will be using for her dissertation to look at um, early childhood risk factors for obesity at age five. And the School of Nursing also has a application in, and they're collaborating with us as well. So without further ado, I'll introduce um, Erica. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. All right. Um, thank you for having me. Um, thank you, Sarah, Ruby, for inviting me. Uh, we are very excited to, we being the WIC program in Miami-Dade, are very excited to be able to share with you uh, some of what we do and some of our opportunities for collaboration and uh, innovation, I hope. Um, I'm going to give you a little bit of background of who we are and what we do, the services we provide, and um, hopefully you'll leave with a better understanding of, of the different types of things that we do. A lot of people don't really understand the breadth of uh, work that, that WIC encompasses and the impact that we make in the community. So my hope is that, you know, like I said, you leave with a very good understanding of what we do. And please, if you have questions, um, feel free to raise your hand if I'm not explaining something clearly. I'd be happy to clarify. So the title of my presentation today is Another Player Has Entered the Game, UM Collaboration and Partnership with the Miami-Dade County WIC Program. Um, this is a fairly new collaboration uh, that, that we've entered into with the University of Miami. We're very excited about the opportunities that uh, we will have, hopefully in the future, to work with the university, to share ideas with the university, um, and to do research and all sorts of awesome ideas, because um, it really is something that we've never done before, at least in Miami-Dade County WIC. And I think in the state of Florida as well, we, we really have not had too many partnerships like this before. So I think it's a really positive thing. So what is WIC? A lot of people have heard of WIC, uh, but a lot of people don't know what we do. Um, WIC stands for, like Sarah said, the Special Supplemental Nutrition Program for Women, Infants, and Children. Okay, and that's where that WIC comes from. It is a federally funded program and it is administered by USDA and the Food and Nutrition Service. So just to give you an idea about our umbrella, from the local level we are, I'm speaking on behalf of the Miami-Dade County WIC program. But our program is housed within the Miami-Dade County Health Department. That really was our old name. It's now called the Florida Department of Health in Miami-Dade County because all county health departments in the state of Florida are integrated and we report to the state office which is the Florida Department of Health. So that's the first umbrella. Above that umbrella then is the Food and Nutrition Service at the national level, and above Food and Nutrition Service is USDA, 
and the people that hold the purse strings are Congress. Okay, and they appropriate our funding and they reauthorize our program to continue. Our, continu our program is not an entitlement program, meaning that we don't automatically exist um, every five years. Our program has to be reauthorized to continue. And uh, luckily we have been reauthorized for over 40 years now. Um, our funds, are, we are a block grant program, so the funds are appropriated by Congress and then they get dispersed down to the, most of the time, state agencies, but there are um, private, well, they're not really privatized, but they are individual WIC clinics, so cities and municipalities can run their own WIC programs. In states like California, Planned Parenthood can have a WIC program and contract with the WIC program to receive some of those block grant funds. So there's a lot of different ways that WIC functions in different areas. In the state of Florida, we all, like I said, fall under the Florida Department of Health and we report to a state WIC bureau. Um, I wanna show you just a quick overview video because this is a, it really does give the picture of, of what we're about. And uh, this was a video created by the National WIC Association, which is a national advocacy group for our organization. I'm just gonna press play and you can. shows you all the things that, that we do. We really, you know, obviously we're not providing that primary care, we're not that emergency care, but we are that safety net for a lot of families, not just women, not just children, dads, grandparents, foster parents. And, um, you know, we provide that little bit of extra that really helps support those families. We, we feel uh, be healthy and have healthy, you know, children. So just a little bit more detail about what we, what we provide. Um, we provide healthy foods. That was the crux of why we were started over 40 years ago. Um, so essentially we are a nutrition program, but we very specifically uh, give only healthy foods, very specific options. We are not the food stamp program. A lot of people hear WIC and think that we're the food stamp or the SNAP program. Two very different programs uh, managed completely different under two different um, bodies and of organizations at the federal level and our goals are very different and so WIC is really about that healthy component. Um, we provide a comprehensive nutrition assessment to every single person that walks in our door and I'll get a little bit more into that later. A lot of breastfeeding support. We are proud to be one of the primary figures in, in breastfeeding support and leading that movement of change that it has brought us to where we are now which is more of our moms and babies breastfeeding. And WIC was one of the first programs to really support that. Nutrition counseling and education, again, we give that one-on-one -on -one and group counseling and education to both you know, our regular low-risk children as well as our high-risk families, families, uh, infants and children and families with severe health issues. And a big thing that we do and a big focus of what we've been doing in the last couple years is being a referral network, um, being a place where people can get more help outside of us and linking people to the right place when they really don't know where, where else to go. 
So just some WIC facts. So nationwide right now, WIC has about 8.9 million participants on our program. Participants means people who are actively on the program and receiving our benefits. Um, there, you can be enrolled in WIC and go through the certification process, which I'll go over in a minute, but if you're not coming back and continuing to participate, you're not considered a participant. So these are actively participating people. So actually the number of people enrolled in WIC is higher. It's about probably 20% higher. Like Sarah mentioned, WIC serves 53% of all infants born in the US. And what that means is that at some point in a baby's life, at least 53% of those babies will have touched WIC at least once, okay? They may not stay on the whole time, but they have been touched at least once by the WIC program. So we have such a reach nationwide in our communities. We're able to you know, touch so many people, so many families at at least some point in their life. And something that's interesting about this, of those 53% of infants that are being touched by the WIC program, about 41.6% of those are Hispanic, and this is nationwide data. So Miami is gonna be a little bit different, a little bit higher probably on this Hispanic range. About 20.3% of those are non-Hispanic black uh, WIC participants. In Miami-Dade, Sarah mentioned we have 73,000. I just looked at the numbers and we're a little bit closer to 72 right now. Our numbers change every single month. I monitor that very closely. You'll see one of our indicators later on. Um, we have 17 WIC clinics throughout the Miami-Dade County. One of them is kind of a pseudo clinic. Here on the Jackson campus, we actually have a WIC site um, right, right next door to the Mailman Center where anyone who's receiving services at Jackson, a lot of times these high-risk consultations happen here. These clients may live all over the city or in different counties even, and they can just go to the WIC office here. We also have a WIC office on the mother-baby floor uh, in the delivery area at um, Jackson, and that's very unique. We're one of the last ones in Florida to have that uh, linkage, and that's very special because we're reaching babies right when they're born. We're reaching moms right after they deliver, and we're able to give support support services and that continuity of care right away. Um, we have about 250 vendors currently accepting WIC. This is an interesting part that most people don't know about as well. We have contracts with vendors to provide uh, or to accept our WIC benefits. So not just any store can accept a WIC benefit. And that's because there's requirements for vendors. Like I mentioned, we have very specific guidelines for the foods that we provide. And a vendor has to have minimum inventory of those things. They have to agree to be audited. There's a lot of quality control measures that go into that. And so this is a partnership with the communities as well and our, and our vendors and the, the private industry that works in our community. So all of the major grocery stores accept WIC, but we also have a lot of mom and pop stores and, and what we call food deserts. And these are little neighborhood corner stores that become a part of the WIC program and they're able to contract with us and provide some of those healthy foods when maybe they wouldn't have done that before if they weren't a partner of the WIC program. Um, since I said we're a nutrition program, we have about 75 nutrition staff currently working for us here in Miami-Dade, and about 29 of those are registered or licensed dietitians. So we are really a true nutrition program, and we have that professional staff. So who is eligible for WIC? So WIC, women, infants, and children, that's pretty obvious, right? That's who you think qualifies. Women, they can be pregnant. A lot of people know that. They can be breastfeeding. A lot of people don't know that you can be postpartum. Um, and be on WIC for up to six months after your delivery. You can also be postpartum mom if you've had a miscarriage or lost your child, and you can still be on the WIC program for up to six months after that loss. A lot of people don't know that, and the reason we do that is because of that interconception care. There's still a lot of care that needs to go on, especially with your nutrition, if you've gone through something like that. And so that's something we stress to a lot of members of the community that come, come to us. You know, you don't just have to have a baby in your arms. Um, infants up to their first year of age, um, and then they become toddlers and they're eligible as a child to be on the WIC program up to their fifth birthday, okay? And you must be a current Florida resident. Now this is important. A current Florida resident means you just have to show us something that you live here. That could be a letter from the person you're living with that's signed by them that says, this person is living with me. It doesn't have to be a formal notarized legal document. We're not, we're trying to make this easy on people who are having a hard time already. So with that being said, WIC is one of the few programs that also does not ask about uh, immigration status. There is no requirement uh, to ask about that and, and we, don't, we just don't ask any of those questions and, and that's been a part of the WIC program for over 40 years. 
Um, and that's very important. In Miami-Dade County, most of our migrant population lives down south and we do have migrant camps and we see a lot of those um, women and families uh, down that way. But we also have a lot of undocumented immigrants throughout our city from various places and various nationalities. So this is something that's probably, that's been in the news and it's a hot topic for us um, recently as well. Um, to be eligible, you must be at nutrition risk. Well, what a study from the Institute of Medicine found is that every single person is at nutritional risk in this country. This was a few years ago. So basically everyone qualifies on this. Uh, in the, I think it was in the 90s, um, if we couldn't find a risk code to give and assign you, you might not be eligible to be on the WIC program, even if you were eligible every other way. So this was a good thing because when the IOM came out with this study that said, hey, everybody's at some kind of nutritional risk, this made it you know, easier for us to reach more people. Um, and the big thing that most people know is that you must be income eligible. And the income level is that you must be at or below 185% of the federal poverty level. Every year the feds update the poverty level, the numbers change slightly. For most of the entitlement programs, um, we're talking about food stamps, um, Medicaid, you must be at 100% or below the poverty level. WIC has an 85% little bit you know, nudge up. So it allows some people who are maybe working families, but who are still struggling to be eligible for a program. A lot of people also don't know this. This is not just for the Medicaid population. We see a lot of uh, women, infants and children who, you know, are, they're, both parents are working and they're going through a hardship. Or maybe someone's just lost a job. Um, so, however, if you are on one of those um, programs, Medicaid, temporary cash assistance, or food stamps, you do automatically qualify, and our systems do communicate about that. Just to give you a picture of what an income, our income guidelines look like, they're going to be updating this probably in April or May of this year. But last year, um, and for a family of four, uh, that annual income must not be more than $44,955. Now, this is gross income before taxes, and, and we are required to look at that. So, you know, it's, it's a little, the actual money in pocket is a little less, um, and that's about $865 a week, okay? And just to give you an idea of how we count family size, um, there may be mom and dad living in the same household, there may be two children that they're caring for, um, maybe grandma lives there too, and they support grandma. That would be a family of five. If a woman is pregnant, we actually count the unborn child as another member of the family. Um, there, I can't tell you, there are so many scenarios of family situations that we get into which are sometimes very difficult to figure out. You know, all sorts of people living here, people that we're giving cash assistance to. You know, we have to go on what people tell us. We do look at income documents. Um, some people get paid cash only. Um, and so we have to sift through all of this stuff. So our staff are very well versed in how to do that. Um, but it can get hairy sometimes. Um, but this is a major requirement of the program and everyone must um, be uh, income eligible assess and, and do their assessment at least once annually during the time that they're on WIC. Um, food package and EBT card. So in 2014, actually the WIC program moved from using checks to issue our food benefits to an EBT card, which is similar to what the Food Stamp and SNAP program does. So basically all of our benefits are on this card and it has a pin number just like a regular you know, credit card or check card. And this is a picture of kind of some of the food that we provide. There are no brand names, obviously, because there's a lot of different uh, variety. Like I mentioned, we focus on healthy foods and the foods have to meet certain nutrition requirements. So for example, you see rice up there, but it says brown rice. We do not allow white rice, okay? That's just one of the requirements. It meets, and, and one of the other grains that you can buy if you don't want to buy brown rice is bulgur, okay? so. Not a lot of people eat that, but there's variety there. There's options. We'll give people options. Um, for cereals, that says oat cereal or shredded wheat. There's a long list of cereals that you can get, but they have to meet sugar content um, requirements, no, no more than X grams of sugar added. They can't have other additives and chocolate and all these things that kids like. You're welcome to add whatever you want when you get home, but when you buy it from the WIG program, it has to meet these guidelines. Low fat milk is a requirement in the state of Florida for majority of children who are over the age of two, uh, which is a hot button issue uh, for a lot of parents. Um, 
fruits and vegetables. We do provide fruit, fresh fruits and vegetables and that was a new uh, requirement. We were so happy once we got that because that wasn't around for a long time in the way program. And we felt like that was misrepresenting what we were trying to do because we talk about fruits and vegetables all day. We actually give um, canned fish, tuna, salmon to uh, women who are breastfeeding. Um, we, uh, you know, there's all sorts of baby foods. Um, we do provide, like I mentioned, a lot of breastfeeding support. We also do provide formula and medical foods. The state of Florida actually is, is one of the states, not every state does this, that provides medical, me medically necessary foods and formula to children and infants. So these are our extremely specialty formulas and foods that you cannot buy in the grocery store. And we will be able to provide that directly from the WIC office. They don't even have to go to the pharmacy to get that. Um, we'll order it for them. And the, the formulary is about 100 pages long, and so pretty much everything that exists out there, if it comes from a doctor and a prescription, we will be able to provide that. I will mention though that the WIC program is a supplemental nutrition program. The WIC program was never meant to provide 100% of the nutrients and needs for a family or for a person. It truly is, here's a little bit extra to help you out and to hopefully boost your nutrition but it's never gonna meet those needs. And so that's important to recognize, with, especially with regards to medical foods. Um, so we work with Medicaid, if a child has Medicaid and they need those medical foods and we're not able to provide more than the maximum uh, amount that the WIC program can provide, we can work with Medicaid to supplement that and make sure that those children are getting that full amount. But the WIC program will never be able to provide that full amount, okay? There's still some level of uh, responsibility that has to fall on the family. So the EBT card has made this a lot easier though for families in the grocery store. Before EBT there were checks and the check said one and a half gallons of low fat or reduced milk and it had all these words on it and you had to buy all the foods on one check that were you know all listed together or else you lost it. You know, there was not a lot of uh, flexibility with that and so the EBT um, system has made it a lot easier on families. Again, we're trying to make things easier on people. Nutrition counseling and education, I mentioned that we do this. There's a lot of words on this screen, but basically um, we have different levels of clients based on the nutrition assessment that we complete by our trained nutrition professionals. Uh, a person can be deemed as a low risk or a high risk client. And we have a lot of codes that we use to, to determine that based on the assessment. So a high risk uh, infant might be an infant that was born premature or low birth weight, or maybe something more serious like a congenital disease. Um, a high risk mother could be um, one with uh, gestational diabetes. And so we'll be able to identify that based on the nutrition assessment and then provide more specialized care if they're considered medically high risk with one of those medical conditions that I mentioned, only a licensed or registered dietitian can provide that consultation to that client. So it's not, even though we are you know, a public health program, we're trying to influence the health of a population, we do provide specialized care to these certain people that have been identified as needing it. Okay. We set goals with our clients and we, we complete an extensive questionnaire which we review and assess with each family. Something that's important that, you know, um, that will relate to what Cynthia is going to talk about is we share the growth chart with our clients at every visit. So for our children, who we have a large population that is overweight and or obese, we talk about that growth chart at every visit. We print it for them and, and every staff member is encouraged to do that with our clients. I mentioned breastfeeding. This is a huge part of our program and it's been a huge um, priority in the last few years, even more than it was before. Um, breastfeeding promotion and support, we have breastfeeding peer counselors. This is a very unique program. We hire women who have prior breastfeeding experience to come work for us to be counselors to our moms, to help them be successful with their breastfeeding goals. And this has been an extremely successful program. It's been around for, for I think, at least 10 years. And we actually get separate, a separate pool of funding to support these, these moms who come work for us. And we have found that the results are just enormous and it's really that peer support that really makes a difference in a mom's life when she's really struggling or really trying to be successful at breastfeeding. We also have international board certified lactation consultants on staff to be able to provide high risk assessment and care if needed. And this is a huge um, positive as well. A lot of, really, this is a, a local initiative. Most other counties in Florida do not have this because this is not supported by the Peer Counselor Grant. We've had to set aside our own WIC administrative dollars to be able to hire IBCLCs, but we feel like this is extremely important because there's only so much a peer counselor can do. And with the scope of practice, sometimes a mom really needs a hands-on care. And unlike 
dietitians who you might be able to find out in the field or maybe even uh, pediatricians or their or primary doctors most people don't have a lot of professional breastfeeding experience and when something's really going on and a mom is going through pain cracked lady nipples um, maybe having a fever and she might have mastitis somebody needs to be able to help her through that because that could become a very dangerous situation and also it'll you know end up hampering her goals and maybe not allowing her to be successful later on with her infant at breastfeeding. So we do a lot of work with this. This is a picture of a class that um, we do with some of our infants and we have models and we sit the mom down with fake babies and we show them even before they have babies what posi positioning to do, what to consider. We even talk about delivery methods and I really believe that the WIG program isn't just about um, you know, teaching moms how to eat right and breastfeeding and those things. It's about empowering women to make decisions for themselves and allowing them to make those decisions. And sometimes in when they go through uh, the hospital system, they're not feeling like they have a choice. And there are a lot of options. And we talk about the things that impact things like breastfeeding. If you get an epidural, it can affect things. If you do choose to do so, this is just the information. Um, you know, if you do a pacifier, that could impact your breastfeeding goals too. You should know that. Um, but then allow them with that information to make whatever choice um, that they feel is best for their family. And so we work with them on that. And so, and this is something that they won't get anywhere else. There's very few places where they can get this interaction. And, and this actually over here on the left is one of our peer counselors. And she actually had her infant with her. We allow peer counselors to bring their infants to work and wear them in a sling for up to a year of age. And so she was able to use her own infant to show our moms, you know, how to continue to breastfeed even through that first year, which can be very, very difficult um, sometimes. We do a lot of breastfeeding education support groups, like I said, one-on-one -on -one counseling and follow-up by those IBCLCs. We have an extensive breast pump loan program. We have all sorts of types of breast pumps that we loan for free to our WIG moms. These can be hospital-grade double electric pumps for our preemies. These can be manual pumps for moms that just have to go to work and need to use it only sometimes. So we're very proud of this and this is often a, a, a last resort sometimes for moms that, that don't have a lot of other options. They're going back to work and, and they're calling us saying, I'm just gonna stop breastfeeding because I don't have any other way to do this. And we give them that option. We do a lot of one-on-one -on -one breastfeeding outreach. Um, we have a lot of partners in the community now, Healthy Start is one of them, where we actually provide um, breastfeeding one-on-one -on -one courses for them and anyone from the community can come. We have a lot of um, providers come, care coordinators, just to learn about what they need to know the basics of breastfeeding. A lot of this sometimes has to do with workplace environment as well. We do a lot of um, consultation and technical assistance. We're work this is kind of a project that's new for us, but we're working with business places, child care centers to help make them more breastfeeding friendly. And so really this is to change the environment in some of our workplaces or places where we leave our children so that our moms feel more comfortable continuing to breastfeed even when they're not able to be with their child. And um, like I mentioned, the peer counselor program, which we're very proud of. Um, extensive referral network and partnerships. This is a huge initiative that we've really been pushing in the last um, couple of years. This is, that, this is a missing piece that when I came into this role, I felt like we could do better on. And this is just an example of the types of uh, partnerships that we have. So I, I obviously you know U University of Miami is a new partnership and we're looking at research opportunities. But human trafficking, we work with organizations like the International Rescue Committee to train our staff to learn how to identify victims of trafficking. We get that uh, often. Uh, a woman will come into the office and she'll be very quiet and we ask the woman the questions because there's a lot of health questions that we need to ask her that only she can answer and a gentleman will answer and they won't allow them to talk. Those are warning signs and we have an obligation to be able to identify those if we can and help these women. Bereavement services organizations. There's a lot of organizations, nonprofits in the community that actually provide bereavement services. Our families experience loss obviously like everybody and a lot of times these families like I said don't have anywhere to go and they don't feel like they qualify for some of these support services or they can't pay for therapy so we can we can link them um, nurse family partnership that's a home visit program for any any new mom doesn't matter the income level in Miami Dade County can be a part of the nurse family partnership and they will get home visits and support from a nurse um, early steps which is um, early childhood uh, education and, and development uh, food banks, hospitals, Read to Learn, that's a program with the Miami, uh, 
Miami-Dade campus, um, and they provide free books to our WIC sites so that we can give free books to our children at every visit. We know that the number of books in a home, um, you know, can indicate how well a child is going to be literate. So we partner with all sorts of things. Anything we can do to impact this family's life, we do. So um, we're very proud of that. So I want to talk about does it does it work uh, a little bit. So you know about the services, um, but does it actually make a difference? Are, are we impacting the lives of our, our, our families? And I want to tell you just a picture of a WIC client. I want to, I want to again put this picture. It's not just you know the mom and the baby and the child and the dad and the nuclear family. There's so many different types of families out there that need different types of help. Um, I, I can tell you a, a personal story. I'll never forget this woman. She looked to me to be like 85 years old. And she came into the WIC office, and this is when I was working in the clinic. And it was down south in a very low income neighborhood. And I started asking her my general, you know, questions. And I said, so um, let's call her Mary. You know, little Mary, um, she's two. Um, so what's going on with her? You know, how, what's your relationship with her? Are you grandma? And she said, no, I'm the great grandma. I said, oh, okay. So are you here just for the WIC visit today? And she said, um, no, actually, um, it's unfortunate. Mom, you know, my granddaughter got messed up in a lot of bad things and she got messed up on drugs and she was with a man and he um, was abusing Mary. And so they lost custody of the child and they're just you know both not well and so I was able to adopt her so this great grandmother adopted this two-year-old and she's about to start raising this child uh, from the beginning and you know it, it's just an example the different like I said the different types of people out there and how much she needs help she needs support because this poor lady you know I'm sure she wasn't planning on doing this you know this wasn't a part of her life plan and because she loved this child so much, you know, she's doing that. So we can be, you know, there for her, learn about that situation, get her to the right network of people to be able to support her. So now that you have that picture of the types of people that could be on the program, does it work? So let's talk about infants. I'm just going to give you a few small snippets of some, some research that I found. Um, this is a study that found that infant mortality is lower amongst WIC participants and especially African Americans. So this is showing the impact of WIC on infant mortality and the, the, you see here on the left all. So for WIC participants in general, doesn't matter you know, race, um, infant death per 1,000 live births in this count, uh, community in Ohio was 8.0. But for non-participants it was 10.6. So that's showing a protective factor there. We're showing a, a, an impact on infant mortality for just all WIC clients in general if they've been on the program. For white, 6.7 versus 7.8 in the general population. But look at the difference for African Americans, 9.6 versus 21.0. That is substantial. And this isn't just one community, um, but other many other studies have found the same impact at different varying degrees. And I think that's really very, very important and it really shows you know, the impact that we can make, especially if we get a mom in early. And also, oftentimes, if we get the family going on, I, we used to have paper charts, and there were some families that were, had charts this big because there were generations of moms and grandmas and children that were coming through, and we would see them. We kept all their records in the same chart, and I found that amazing. Um, and that's a testament to the longevity of, of our program and, and the impact that we can make over generations. This is a, a, a study that was looking at how um, consumption was impacted of fruits and vegetables, of healthy foods amongst WIC participants. In 2012, I mentioned fruits and vegetables. That was when the WIC food package changed and they introduced fruits and vegetables. They changed um, a lot of the other food guidelines and really improved them. And that was all based on an IOM study as well. So what this is showing that in Calif amongst these California WIC participants, um, they did a survey with them and they asked them some questions. Does your family eat more whole grains since we changed the food package? Do they drink more lower fat milk? Are they eating more fruits and vegetables? Are they consuming fruit more frequently? And you'll see that all of those, the, there was a significant percentage change, especially at the whole grains and the milk level. Maybe a little bit less at fruit and vegetables because that's a difficult one that we always have a hard time impacting. But you see there's an impact there. 51% said we're eating more whole grains just by having those other options in the WIC food package that didn't exist before. So people are making changes in their diet, in their nutrition. 
this is going to relate a little bit to what Cynthia is going to talk about, but you know, where are, where are clients getting information? Sometimes you know, we, we know in WIC we give a lot of information, but are, is it really useful to them? Are they really valuing it? Do they value it as, as much as what their grandmother gives them or their neighbor or their doctor? And what this is showing is that mo the majority of people are getting feeding information, 66% from their doctor or health professional. But when we surveyed them, the second highest number was the WIC site. Okay, so we're right there next to their doctor or health professional. We're that second person that they're gonna go to and ask some of the questions that they may have asked the doctor, maybe they didn't. Maybe they, maybe they didn't have enough time, maybe they didn't feel comfortable, maybe they just didn't have it on their mind then, and we're that second opportunity to get some questions answered. And I'll tell you, we get a lot of, um, since we ask very specific questions about nutrition, we'll get a lot more answers than maybe the pediatrician would at that time. You know, we ask, do you put things in the bottle? I can't tell you how many times somebody says, oh, I put cereal, or oh, I put cafe con leche. You know, in Miami, we get a lot of that. Okay, now that's an opportunity to talk about this, okay? But if I had never asked those specific questions, she wouldn't have told me. Okay, or we ask questions about pica, you know, or um, do you find yourself craving some of these non-food items? And we can talk about that, but no one else is probably asking those very specific questions. Um, family members rank high too, but you know, that was very impressive to me about, we, we are considered a reputable source to these families. Um, this is similar, and this is related to breastfeeding, and this was um, the percentage reporting breastfeeding problems in the last month who received help by source of support. So again, that source of support, where did they go at month one, month three, and month five of breastfeeding? If you look again, WIC office or clinic, month one, 45.7% are talking to us, 54.7% at month three are talking to us, 51.6% at month five are talking to us. I think this is important because actually we're getting more moms talking to us at the later months when maybe, you know, everybody knows breastfeeding is hard in the beginning, but who's supporting them as they go on? It doesn't always get easier. And there's always new challenges that come up. And we're there for them through the entire first year with breastfeeding support when maybe other places are not. And again, that breastfeeding support is free, which is very hard to find. Um, again, this is another one about food packages. And this is about impact in our grocery stores and our private vendors, okay? When we change the food package, how did that impact their stores? Remember what I said earlier, they're required to have minimum inventory. If they decide to be a part of the WIC program, they have to have a minimum inventory of specific food items because we want to make sure that our clients aren't going to be running around all over the county to try to find what they want. So we want to make it easy for them. So this is in a small store, I think in Connecticut, or small stores, and they have a healthy food supply score, and this is based on a score that the study used um, to assess um, if they had the healthy foods or not. And when you look at it from when the, we did the uh, food package chain pre and post, you're seeing that fruits and vegetables in the WIC authorized stores, we have 17% more fruits and vegetables than we did before and versus other stores. Look at tofu soy milk. This is a big one. This was a new thing that was added. Soy milk, we didn't have that for many 30 plus years, but now we do. And Florida doesn't have tofu yet, but we hope to have it soon. But 100% had that, okay? versus the other stores, the neighborhood corner stores, and those food deserts that didn't. 17% only had those. 41% overall had more healthy foods than the non-WIC stores. So I think that's important, and that's a, a systems change. Okay, we're impact, impacting that environment, even though we're not really, they're not part of the WIC program, we're impacting those neighborhoods. And from the dollar sense, because we're a federal program, and this is important um, to show that the WIC program is very cost-effective program. It's one of the most cost-effective programs that exist. This is just a, an infographic about WIC spending as a share of GDP. And what it's showing is that not only have we been you know, fairly stable and it's a very low amount, you'll see in 1997 it was less than 0.05% of GDP. It's actually gone down over the years. And that's important because we have been a stable program and we have a lot of cost containment measures in the WIC program that have allowed us to be financially successful and not place a large burden on the federal government budget. So, in, kind of in closing in my part, I wanna say that WIC works. Um, I believe that it does. And this is a picture of the socio-ecological model. And I think what I've, what I've said today is that, you know, WIC, WIC hits a lot of different parts. Public policy, you know, at that national level, there's a lot of advocacy going on from the WIC program, from the National WIC Association to keep WIC around because of all of the 
data and the research that shows that we are a program that really makes a difference. At the community level, obviously we mentioned those grocery stores, changing food deserts um, just by having some WIC vendors when there might not be any other stores there. And we also contribute to the income of the community. In my media county, we contribute over $40 million annually to the economy just from the benefits that are cash in the stores. Okay? Organizational, we work with all of our partner organizations. Interpersonal, we, we encourage our family members, you know, our families to bring their family members to appointments. Let's bring grandma because I guarantee if grandma is providing her a lot of information, grandma needs to learn too. Let's educate the entire community and, and the family. And at that individual level, that's where we work with our IBCLCs and our nutritionists to make impact on their behaviors. I just want to briefly mention some data and talk about the relationship with uh, the University of Miami and the opportunities that may exist with other organizations as we move forward that we're very excited about. We track lots of data. The WIC program has tons and tons of data, data-rich program. But I'll tell you that until very recently, we haven't shared a lot of this data. Or the only people we'll share it with is national organizations like USDA or the Economic Research Service who have access to it. And I'm happy to say that now those doors are opening a little bit to work with some really smart people who can assess that data and really look at what's going on. We have lots of breastfeeding data, initiation data on all infants, on non Hispanic black infants, duration at three, six months, at a year, exclusivity. We look at participation and enrollment um, by client category, breastfeeding data. We can drill down pretty much any which way we want. Um, more data, I'm not gonna go through all of it, but tons of assessment and behavioral data. I talked about that extensive nutrition assessment that we do. We do an online questionnaire and everything since 2014 is automated, no longer paper. But even before 2014, we have you know, 20, 30 years of data that we can access. Uh, first trimester entry, we, looked at, we look at productivity measures for our staff. So there's just tons of stuff out there. Just to, just to you know, give you a picture of what we've got and that I can pull on demand, we can also run queries and you know, get IRB approval for more um, enhanced data, but this is our caseload. Like I mentioned, we're right at the 70, we're on an average 72, 73,000. The, the orange line on the left going down is where we're at now. We always have a drop during the holidays. Our most recent data is December. We're almost about 60 days behind but um, we always have a drop in December, January because of holidays. People, people go away, they don't come to wake appointments, and also we're closed a little bit more. But this is to give you an idea over five years what we've looked like in Miami-Dade. And we've hovered as low as 62,000 and gone as high as that 73,000 mark, okay? And we work at this very hard because clients keep our program going. If people don't know we exist, we won't exist. This is a real simple fact. And we want to reach everybody we can. I know Sarah mentioned, you know, we reach so many people, but we're actually only meeting about 82% of the eligible, potentially eligible population in Miami-Dade. There are so many people, almost 20% of people that could be on with it or not. And we have to work harder to be able to reach those people and meet their needs. Because maybe we're not meeting 100% of their needs. This is just an example of the, the drill down that we can give you. When I mentioned breastfeeding duration, this is Miami-Dade County versus Broward in the state since December 14. And this is, matches the nationwide trends that we're increasing and improving on our breastfeeding duration. Um, this is any breastfeeding at 26 weeks or more. So Miami-Dade is doing better than the rest of the state in duration. And we really believe this is because of our extensive breastfeeding um, program and efforts that are very unique to Miami-Dade. But we can drill down further than that. This is by area. So if I look at Miami-Dade only, we, we organize everything in Miami-Dade by areas, north, central, and south because of their specific population elements. And so we'll see here that my central area was doing very well and they've done better than the majority of my other areas, but my south area in the blue line went from about 37% to a high of about 46, 47%. They've improved their breastfeeding rate significantly. So what I'll do is I'll go back to my staff and I'll say, what's going on there? Well, it turns out we've been hiring some more pair counselors and volunteer pair counselors that match the population down there. We put someone in our homestead office that's from Guatemala, that speaks some of the dialect that is not Spanish and not any other language that most people speak, and that's made a difference, okay? So we know that we're making an impact, and we can drill down further. This is a little bit of a crazy graph, but um, this is um, breastfeeding duration, the same thing, drilling down by looking at the units. And these units represent the specific communities, and they represent zip codes, too. We can actually query specific zip codes, but you'll see here South Miami is the third um, row of bars. They, they do very well. It's a very different demographic than, let's say, 
two over Frederica Wilson and Juanita Mann. That's our Liberty City Clinic. Mm -hmm. Lowest rates, highest population of you know Amer African American community. We know they have issues with breastfeeding. Okay, we need to impact them more. Now compare that over a little bit more to NMB, which is North Miami Beach. Our Haitian population does great with breastfeeding. They have a lot of support in their community. So they represent these communities and we can look down and, and see where we need to make that impact. Childhood overweight and obesity. Um, we're looking at um, Miami-Dade versus Broward versus the state. Miami-Dade is high up there. Unfortunately, it's the opposite of breastfeeding. We're not doing as well with that. The, the Broward is, has done well, but they've seen an increase in childhood obesity and overweight as well. This matches the national population that this is a problem. And, and you'll see from the Miami-Dade line, it hovers around 27 and we haven't made a difference. So we're not doing as much as we can. We know that we need to do more there. And um, with that, I'm gonna let Cynthia take over. Um, but I, again, I, 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 I wanted to stress that we have so much information and we're so eager to share it and we're so eager to hear your ideas as well. And I, I just wanna say thank you so much for letting me speak about the WIC program. Thank you. Hello, my name is Cynthia Lebron. I'm a second year student in the Prevention Science and Community Health Program here at UM. Um, recently, um, maybe a couple months ago, I was sitting at the IPC meeting and um, we got to meet Erica Grover and she presented all of this amazing um, information and all of us around the table were just salivating at the idea that there's all this data that they are um, uh, collecting and then that really nobody has looked at some of these things that we're interested in so just to give you a, a background of some of the interests um, early childhood obesity is a problem and when we're talking about early childhood obesity this is in the first five years of life so one in four children are overweight or obese but when we're looking specifically at two to five year olds a health disparity exists among the different um, racial and ethnic minorities. So Hispanics have the highest rates of obesity, and again, this is specific to two to five year olds, 15.6% of Hispanics, 10.4% of non-Hispanic blacks, and then only 5% of Asians and 5.2% of whites. So you can see how big those gaps are. Um, what's important to know is that children who are overweight during these early childhood years are, are at least five times more likely to be overweight or obese as adults. Um, so it's really important that we get to them at this like, crucial, critical period. Um, there's also a higher prevalence estimates of obesity among ethnic minority groups that's often underscored by lower socioeconomic status. So what are some of the risk factors that contribute to these huge disparity gaps? Well, there's a huge long laundry list you can see. Um, gestational weight gain, maternal smoking, um, breastfeeding, sleep duration. The good thing about this is that WIC is, often, uh, WIC is um, collecting data on all of these risk and protective factors. So we can look at some of these things and see how it affects the families in our community. So it shouldn't come as a surprise that there's a health disparity in those risk factors. So studies show that Hispanics and non-Hispanics blacks are often disproportionately affected by this higher prevalence of gestational diabetes, non-breastfeeding exclusivity, poor bottle feeding practices and very early introduction of solid foods, and, um, and television sets in ch children's bedroom. The issue is that we really don't know how socioeconomic status um, affects that relationship of race and ethnicity among these different risk factors. So the reason we don't know this is because there's a huge scientific inequity in our current literature. Um, we know that all of these um, risk factors, we know about all these risk and protective factors for childhood obesity, but the problem is that most of these um, studies are taking place in high income populations with predominantly non-Hispanic white participants. So we don't know how all of these things affect different um, racial and ethnic minorities and how SCS plays in them, just because we haven't done the science there yet. Um, so it's, it's important to note that 44% of um, U.S. children are currently li living in low economic environments and another 22% um, are living in poverty. So this makes it really pertinent to investigate these early life risk factors for obesity that could lead to chronic morbidity. So I'm not going to harp on, on WIC because Erico did such an amazing job at presenting this. I will say that um, when I started learning about all of these risk and protective factors, 
Um, I wanted to um, dive a little bit more into, into um, what's going on out there. So I started conducting a qualitative um, study where I'm interviewing Hispanic moms with children in the zero to five age range about their food choices and feeding practices, where they're getting their information from. Um, and I've been getting uh, the most, the, the, the themes that are coming out of that are um, their doctors, um, moms, other moms, uh, their own moms, friends, things like that. Um, the internet and, and largely um, I've been getting a lot of WIC. So it's really, um, it's really it, it goes with the, the quantitative data that, that Erico presented and it shows that um, we have an opportunity to really um, get information from these, um, these parents on the things that are missing in the literature right now. So we're going to be conducting a, um, oh, I'll be doing my dissertation with a uh, mentored by Dr. Sarah Messiah and we'll be, we're going to be looking at this data um, from 2011 to 2016 on the, the WIC data to look at some of these risk and protective factors through pregnancy and early childhood and see how it affects childhood obesity at age five. So specifically um, in the perinatal stage, or, or, or excuse me, in the prenatal stage, we'll be looking at um, the the number of mothers who develop gestational diabetes and how that affects how likely children are to be at a healthy weight at age five. Um, what's interesting to note about gestational diabetes is that children who um, have mothers um, that uh, are diagnosed with gestational diabetes are more likely to be obese, but that also those women that have gestational diabetes has a, have a 60% lifetime risk of um, it progressing to type two diabetes. So we see these like dual impact risks. The other, um, the other uh, pr pregnancy factor that we'll be looking at is uh, maternal smoking. Um, so this uh, maternal smoking and other detrimental prenatal behaviors like alcohol consumption and things like that, which um, it's great that WIC collects data on these things because we have seen that this is a risk factor. Um, looking at er, just food choices and feeding practices in the early childhood range, we'll be looking specifically at um, exclusivity of breastfeeding. So for Hispanics in general, um, Hispanics are really great on breastfeeding initiation and duration. So that's good, but the problem is that they also um, have really high rates of formula supplementation as early as two days. At two days of life, they're already supplementing with formula. They have the highest rates of this. So we want to be looking at exclusivity and, and how that affects obesity at five years. Um, and non-Hispanic blacks have some of the lowest rates of breastfeeding initiation, um, duration, and exclusivity. So it would be interesting to see how these different things impact obesity at a later age. Um, the other thing that we'll be talking about is, or we'll be looking at, excuse me, is introdu introduction to solid foods before four <coughs> months of age. Right now, the American Academy of Pediatricians has a recommended um, introduction of solid foods between four and six months. This, uh, so breastfeeding is really consistent in the literature that bre like if the breastfeeding is a protective factor for obesity. The introduction of solid foods is not as consistent at all in the literature. It has very um, different results in different studies. Um, so it's interesting when I do these interviews with moms and I ask them uh, about the information that they're receiving from their pediatrician, largely their responses are breastfeeding and the, um, the early introduction of solid foods. So these are messages that are resounding from the pediatricians, but we don't have the literature to back it up on these solid foods. So it, this will contribute to the literature. Are, is this really making an impact in obesity? Um, what's interesting about the WIC data is that we will be able to look at it among race and ethnicity and also how socioeconomic status um, impacts that. So although there is an income requirement for WIC, um, you know, Erica was so kind to share some of the um, examples of women who are in this program and you would be surprised to see the range in, in, um, in income. So we, we can look at that and see how that impacts um, race and ethnicity on those findings that we would be getting from the previous aims. And what's really, inter in, uh, what's really interesting for my um, data geeks here is that the, the sample size is so big and quick that we'll be able to split up the sample and test this model 
on parts of the sample that are um, will only be a part of the model um, testing, and then we'll take that model and and use it on the other piece of the sample that wasn't as used to estimate that model. So we have this opportunity to cross validate this um, this data to make sure that the model that we are proposing is is actually um, not only that we can estimate it, that but we can train uh, we can train that model to work on different. Um, samples that are not in the original testing. This is really interesting. When you look at the obesity um, data, nobody's doing this. Um, and the ones that are doing this is on specific biologic, uh, biological factors, not like these um, um, behavioral kinds of things. So we'll, we'll be the first ones working with Miami-Dade County WIC data, but then we'll be the first ones to do um, such interesting research as this. So we really have a great opportunity to contribute to the literature here, especially in a place where it's so lacking in um, racial and ethnic diversity. So I just wanted to say thank you so much to all of you and to Aragorn and Dr. Messiah and Dr. Natali who have given me this opportunity to work on this as a dissertation. I can um, tell you that I'm, I'm so excited that this is my project as it's exactly like my dream dissertation. So, <laughs> and I'm sure it would be yours. So thank you and have a great Friday. <laughs>